Hello and you're very welcome to us to the JMAC Podcast. I'm John Wan, of course the podcast brought to you by orgrets.com. Use the JMAC Podcast to get 15% off on their website. And tonight I'm joined by former amateur footballer Kevin McGarty and Gaelic journalist Mal McMullen to talk about last weekend's Allianz Football League action and of course this weekend's Allianz Football League action. And really look forward to chatting to the lads tonight. Mr McGarty, good to see the face again. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, um, John. Obviously, um, I haven't been on in a few weeks. Busy man, but... I talked to you last time about the um, <clears throat> uh, when we were last on with you. We were talking about the start of the leagues, and now we're always I'm back on, and we're halfway through the leagues, so just over halfway through. So I'd uh, be interested to chat, see what Mal, who's obviously been a lot more of the games than, than both myself or yourself, see what he thinks about things. But very interesting, and in a lot of the in a lot of the divisions, not really going as as most people suspected, bar really division two. So be interesting to to hear Mal's thoughts. And division three, Mal, how are you? Not too bad, lads. Always good to chat. And um, a bit like Kevin, I was on holidays the last couple of weekends. It's a feast or a famine. But, uh, <laughs> I got to, I got my letter. Kenny trip took in the game last weekend, and uh, GA Go, I have to admit, is some job for watching football away from home. Our yeah. flight was delayed coming home from Amsterdam, and you're able to sit in the airport and flick through the latter end of two or three games so I can only appreciate if you're someone who's living away from home all the time it must be just brilliant and a bit like as Kevin said at the start of the league you didn't really know what was happening there's still a lot to go like last year's league was decided on the last day so we've a wee bit to go yet but it's starting to I suppose shape up a wee bit mm-hmm. Yeah, lots to play for, no doubt, man, I suppose. News in recent weeks. Jared Burns has been announced as the new GA president. Obviously, he's going to be taking the role now in a couple of months' time. And obviously, Kev, I suppose, what was your initial reaction to Jared getting the main job within the GAA? I suppose a bit underwhelming from my own point of view. And it's not that Jared doesn't have the credentials. Obviously, he's been a um, principal of a school for quite a while. He served on many of the top committees in the GAA. So, you know, in terms of corporate governance, in terms of knowing the rules inside out, he ticks all them boxes. Of course he does. Um, and it was, again, disappointing to see that three candidates ran for the job and they had, they looked like the three men probably plus 55. And one of the things for me is that if we look at Malcolm County there, for example, the operations manager in, um, in Derry, Stephen Barker, was chairman of his own club, chairman of Derry, um, I play. I was at. I happened to be at Queens with Stephen, a very bright guy. Um, and these are the sort of guys that we need to get involved at the highest level of the GA. Lads there who are a wee bit younger, and you know this is not an ageist thing. And one of the problems I have, I think, I suppose, with Jonathan, I wish him the best of luck. But you know, if we go back, I was watching a program recently on 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 the American presidency, and and when. FDR Roosevelt got back in and at, at the time of the Second World War, you know, he was deciding on neutrality. And someone said to him, you know, at the time, you know, you, you were elected back in on a mandate by the people. And he says, yes, that's only a mandate by the people, but real leaders choose to go against the people or choose to bring the people forward through their own ideas. And I think that at the minute, Jardif has had a love affair with the GA for 20 years. You know, they've had a bed in. He's tried to be in this position before. He's not going to rattle a few, you know, cages in Crow Park. I think he's probably seen as a steady hand. And as I say again, I wish him the best of luck. But I really do think that the GA is at a point where we, myself and Miles spoke about this before. Miles spoke very articulately about, you know, the market and communications that we do, how we drive and bring our games forward, how we actually challenge rules. You know, we've we've tinkered over the last couple of years. We've had presidents come in and maybe had a, a manifesto regarding changes to our championships and whatever else or changes to our age groups. That's all fair and good. It is now time to challenge rules because we need to fundamentally change the way the game is, particularly Gaelic football, because it's a very, very boring entity. And we're seeing that, in my opinion, even at the start of the league with these defensive setups. So, you know, best of luck to Jarlath, but... It's another nodding head of acquiescence to the hierarchy. And I wish, I just hope that over the next number of years, we get 
administrators who are, you know, just finished playing at maybe the highest level or club level, who go up through the ranks of their county board, who then get into administration in, in terms of their provincial administration and then run for the highest levels of office. Because I think we're still a wee bit out of touch with our youth and places like that. So moving forward, you know, as I say, I wish them the best, but a bit underwhelmed and, and hopefully the future, maybe people can listen to this and, and maybe think that, you know, going forward for that wee bit of progressiveness in the association, hopefully we get younger candidates running with radical agendas. I suppose, Kev, a point on this is, and like, you know, it, it, if, if from a PR point of view and a leadership point of view, as a start of the GA, definitely this year anyway, Kev, you know, with the Glenn Croke situation, the player welfare, the player expenses, you know, it's it's in the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months, there's been an absolute serious need for leadership. And we've just maybe had some, haven't seen that. So maybe a point maybe you're trying to make is if there's any future topics like we've seen in the last couple of weeks, we need to see Jared stepping up now when he does get that uh, role. Well, he's coming a year. It'll be a year until he steps into the presidency. But I mean, I don't expect anything radical for him. As I say, he's seen as a safe pair of hands. And that's fair enough for people, you know, in the GA, especially those in very cherished positions, maybe as head of the CCC or the director general or the head of finance or Mr. McKenna, who runs Crow Park Stadium. He won't rock too many boats. You know, he's safe for them. What we need to start doing is rocking boats. And I'm not talking about on the financial end of things, because that's all great and can be improved upon. But we need to start looking at practical things. For example, I think it was Mal to raise this, but I've actually seen a tweet about this in the last week. If Larry McCarthy had any bottle or balls whatsoever, he'd be in the GA headquarters making changes about how ticketing is done, for example. You know, it's a it's an ageist thing where people who maybe carry cash aren't, aren't getting into games. You know, it's all about these apps and whatever else. And I understand that's the future, but it's not representative of what our whole association is. And we also must remember, at heart, we are a socialist association in terms of um, our, our member body goes down into every village in, in this island. So small things like that that the GA needs to take a lead on in terms of getting back to grassroots. But as I said to you, mainly for me, Jarrett needs to take the lead or whoever else comes in after him mm-hmm. is on rules. It's not about structure anymore. We've tinkered with the structure. We have a structure for a couple of years. That will be voted on. Rules are really, really, really poor. Rules caused the issue probably in the, in the Cross McLean game. Rules are causing the issue in the demise of Gaelic football in terms of its attraction. I would hope that, that someone like him will come in with a, a somebody else will come in with an agenda to set up a committee. We had one with Eamon, I think it was Eamon McGee, chaired it about 10 years ago. We now need that again because very quickly time moves on. And remember, we've had changes in hurling over the last number of years. For example, the penalty went from the, you know, the 21 yard line, and then we had obviously we had different things around that the arc being brought in, things they got in hurling, you know, the puck out, whatever else we had. So hurling's ever developing. It's a great product and fair play to it. We also need to develop Gaelic football as well, and rules need to be investigated. Forget about structures. Forget about finances in the GA. There's professional people take care of them. They need to be told by the president by those who know the rules inside out, in the game, by the GPA, what players need and what this needs to be a better product. Hmm. I suppose kind of last thing on it, Kev, just to, I suppose I haven't been, okay, I obviously haven't had you on the podcast in the last couple of weeks, suppose, what was your, I suppose, I don't want to send your blood pressure too high on this Thursday evening coming into the weekend, but I suppose what was your initial thoughts and the player expenses followed? It's not good. It's not good. Um, we are, possibly a generation of players on from the player strikes when McGinney and these guys were the four when I first started out playing, when we had these radical meeting agendas at the Waterfront Hall in Belfast, when we had this whole issue of the GPA being formed, you know, we're now 20 years on from that, 15 years on from it, and we're coming back to the same issues and problems. Again, um, I don't know the guy personally from what I know from one of my um, colleagues, Chris Kerr, who, who, does a bit of work for the GPA. Um, Tom Parsons, good guy, but he needs to be in there and he needs to be batting for players. You know, to have players, amateur players, no matter what job they're in. And by the way, many of these guys are students. They're not teachers or doctors or lawyers or or whatever else. They're students having to wait a number of months on, on these sort of things is ridiculous. Then to have the earth on, on social media is ridiculous. So, you know, 
that's what the GPR is there for. And they do a hell of a brilliant lot of work. Don't get me wrong. I mean, in terms of mental health, in terms of player welfare, in terms of medics, in terms of, of, of past member, past player support, in terms of university and educational bursaries, they're a fantastic organization. Hmm. But when it comes to its root, their issue is the bat for players against HQ and they need to go in there and they need to be going in with a wrecking ball because this is not acceptable. And the, let's go back to the final point in this. If the GA players are not playing on the first and third Sunday in, in, in August or July, whatever else it is now, the GA ain't got no money. So treat what's putting dinner on your table right, and that's players. And uh, hopefully they will do that. Hmm. Don't like doing miles after walking out. Maybe it's got too controversial. <laughs> well, <laughs> you get the liquids, man. You get the liquids. This, it's, this could be... man, it's probably a step whiskey you need after listening. <laughs> uh, Shout out to my wife, Pauline. She is a tea ready. So great stuff. Oh, uh, God, hand delivered. If, if hand only. Delivered. Uh, if, if only me, if only me, Kev's uh, mistresses were as as um, I suppose as deficient as that, for want of a better phrase. But we will crack into last weekend's action, lads, on Saturday in Division Four Alliance League football round four in Setu Arena in Carrickmore. It was Wexford. Uh, 212 Waterford 1 uh, 6. Obviously, Wexter getting the points there. And then in Leash Higher or More Park, it was Wicklow 212, Leash 210. Oshie McConda will be absolutely thrilled with that. Another win on the board that he has been badly crying out for in Division 4. And then the games on Sunday in Avant Money Park, Sean McGermott. It was Leitrim 222, Carlo 13 points. And then in Rice, it was Sligo. 110 London six points, so that's obviously the division four games uh, from last weekend wrapped up. And then we'll move on to division three in Carrick Park. It was for Mana 213, Antrim 39. Kevin, any quick thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's just again, like I said to you at the start of the year when I was on uh, with Mal and yourself in the podcast, very quickly. Antrim's score difference is not in the national league right now. And I said to you at the start of the year, if Andy McIntyre wanted to do anything with Antrim, the first thing he got to do is build a dam to stop leaking what they've been leaking for the last number of years, which is goals. They've leaked goals at the back, cost them in two games already this year in the National League. They could possibly have four points. I said they had started league. I didn't know whether we were going to get a point from. They could actually be on six points now. Realistically, you know, Down got very down got out of jail and uh, Fermanagh got out of jail. And, you know, I give Andy McIntyre credit. He seems to have them going pretty well. But it's that leaking of goals that's costing Atlanta points now. And they're in a relegation battle. And look, for me, the three games left, the Westmeath, um, they have um, Calvin, obviously, in Currigan Park, two teams who are at the top end of that level who I think will beat Antrim in nine times out of ten. And then there's that big one against Longford. And Longford temporary result didn't really do Antrim any favours either. So, look, again, I hope he's learned his lesson that Let's concentrate on defence. Let's try and solid up that back. Let's look at what we're doing. Leaking goals ain't going to get you anywhere. We're scoring highly, that's fair enough. But at the other end of the park, we're conceding highly. And, um, you know, again, we're down there fighting relegation where I thought we would be, unfortunately. There we go. And then moving on to Park Essler, as you before mentioned there, it was down 110 Westmead, 11 points. Obviously, a great win for down. Um, obviously, against a strong, strong Westmead team. And Westmead will really want to bounce back after that result uh, this weekend. And we'll move on to the other games on Sunday in Division 3. It was going to miss O'Connor Park. It was Cavan, 21 points, awfully 14 points. Obviously, a good win for Mickey Graham's side away from home. And then in Glennon's brothers, Pierce Park, it was Longford, 14 points, Tipperary. 111. So a draw in Glen Brothers Pierce Park. And then we'll move on to Saturday's um division two action. If I can get it up here now. There we go. Perfect. We can touch on to first of all, it was in Parky Cueve, it was Cork 618, Limerick 12 points. Um Mal. That's a very impressive scoring from Cork, but Limerick are in serious butter. Yeah, they are, and I was at the Limerick Derry game, and it was a damage limitation mission for them that day. And I suppose when you look at the way Derry have been forming, you can understand why. But um, it's just been like they went out the week after, and it was the Dubs, 
So it hasn't been easy. It's, it certainly hasn't been easy. And it probably shows the job Billy Lee had made of Limerick. You know, he was there for quite a while. He'd made them really, really competitive. But Division 2 is obviously a big step up for them. And with a new manager, it's never going to be easy. And it's very difficult. You can't really make a case for them staying up for me. It's um, it's probably going to be a case of dropping down and you know going at the Talton Cup and seeing can you rebuild. That's probably what, they have, what they're going to have to look for, I would imagine. I suppose obviously Cork scoring, Stephen Sherlock is doing very, very well for the minute. Like that, six goals in any game of football, I know maybe the game went a bit dead, but six goals is still impressive scoring, to be fair, from Cork anything. Yeah, it is, and Cork will maybe be sitting to wonder if we had a beaten Meath in the first week of the year. Uh, like last year, Derry were in Division 2 and 11 points didn't take them out. So I know every year is different, but Cork might live to regret that defeat. Seems so, it seems so, and I suppose moving on to other action in Division 2 in Newbridge. It was Derry 215, Kildare 7 points. I suppose Kevy Rory Gallagher is getting a serious tune out of these Derry boys once again, following on last year's good form. And Kildare, like Limerick, are in a spot of bother in Division 2, Kevy. Yeah, well, you know, let me just touch on BBC I players showing this again. Brilliant to see that, you know, brilliant to watch that game live. Fantastic commentary, all credit to. Uh, a lot of old colleagues are in the BBC, but um, realistically, men against boys, did Derry take an awful lot out of this in ways? After the first two or three minutes, when Kildare threatened for the, probably the only time in the game, Derry were much the, the only thing I would say about Derry, and this hurts me a wee bit about them, when I look at a lot of the other games this weekend, especially in Division 1 and 2, there was a good spread of scores. Derry actually only had six scores down in Kildare, and a, a lot of that was was obviously Shane McGuigan. Now, he's scoring from play, he's scoring from set balls, but one thing that really impressed me about Derry is, we've always known they've had a great defence. See their transition from defence to forward and how quick that is, and how well the people know their roles, is really, really good. Um, the other thing I would say about them is, the two or three goal chances in the first half, I think just off the top of my head, keep me right, man, Paul Cassidy had one, Benny Hearn had one, you know, yeah. there could have been a wee bit more um, ruthless um, in it. Um, again, one eight to three points up at half time. The game was over by that stage. Kildare and all sorts of problems. They look the last time they were in Newbridge, they got beat by thirteen points. I think it was by Cork. Yes, they had a morale boost and win. They come out of nowhere to to beat Clare. You know, in the last couple of minutes. But for me. Derry's next game, and I don't know if Mal agree with me about this. He did say this the last time around. They need to have eight points on the board when Dublin comes. And again, he rightly articulates it. I was thinking about this today. Derry didn't get out of that division last year with 11 points. The Russ Common draw cost them. And I think the next game is massive for them because Cork might be having that. We thought that if we have one big game in us, it's probably the Derry game to try and get us up out of here. And the way things are going in Cork is, is pretty good at the minute. So, you know, we know we're going to come on to predictions, but I would think Derry this weekend will be looking at focusing on this as their big performance of the year thus far, and they'll probably be happy to get a draw with Dublin, if I'm honest with you. So it's a good way for them to go into the game. Again, when you're scoring 17 scores, um, as I say, their transitions really, really impressed me. How they turn over the ball, how quickly they get the ball forward, and the amount of guys going up there, you know, in terms of, Yes, you've got the forward, uh, the guys at, 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 like Benny Hearn, but Cassidy is Cassidy's playing midfield. I think he got man of the match in the McKenna Cup final. He can play in midfield. His energy is absolutely brilliant, and he typifies that transition from back to front so much. That, and so do the other guys like now Lachlan and Lachlan Murray and these guys when they get a run. So, you know, I'm really impressed by Derry, but again, we have to quantify that in the fact that I think really in this league there's maybe four decent, four top teams and maybe four teams that can beat each other on any given day. And Derry are one of them top teams and certainly Kildare are one of them teams that, you know, there's just a golfing class between them. Kevin, whenever I said that about early on in the year, the motivation behind it was what happened last year. But when I said four games, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, how big is the Kildare game? 
And I was walking out of a Donald Park, me and my dad, after the Donegal game, I opened up Twitter. And it was 183 points. And I thought to myself, oh my God, they are absolutely cruising here. And I watched it back when I got home. And as you rightly said, they created possibly five, six goal chances in the game. And, you know, people talk about negative football and men behind the ball. Derry, as you said, they are getting forward. You know, what team doesn't really play defensive football? It was the same with Kerry. Kerry obviously kicked the ball a wee bit more than most, but and the dubs. But they're why were they good? They were able to do it both ways. They are getting that they're getting that in their locker. The worry will be, and it's not a discussion for Nate's podcast, the worry will be can they get something different when they get to Crow Park? Yeah. But for now, Paul Cassidy, Paul Cassidy for me sums up Rory Gallagher's tenure. Yeah, absolutely. He played as an inside forward for Balahi. They won the Ulster Minor Tournament in St Paul's. He, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think he played County Minors. He came in and everybody in Derry was saying, what is he doing on this team? But Rory Gallagher handed him his debut 33 games ago. He scored 1-1 as a sub against Longford. He scored 223 from play for a worker. Yeah. And with like he that was a snapshot he took, Kev, the one that was saved. Yeah. He he's summing up what Derry need. And if they could get another one of him for that outlet, it would be a great advantage. Obviously, along with another score, because uh, I think Shane McGuigan has scored something like 50 points, you know, you know, goals and points, a combined total of 50 points. And Niall Toner has scored 25. Paul yeah. Casty is Derry's third top score on eight points. So there's a big gulf there. And Derry are probably going to have to get a wee bit more from elsewhere. But uh, um, I think we just need to go up. It's probably a discussion for later in the pod when we're talking about the divisions. But they just need to actually throw the kitchen sink at Dublin. And if they come up short, worry about it on Sunday morning. I think Derry should treat the Dublin game like the first round of the championship for me. Yeah, I think it's their biggest game in, in terms of, as you say, lessons learned from last year. But mm-hmm. look, I'm glad what you've said. If anybody's watching this podcast before Sunday, I think me and Mal are looking at the same thing. Derry's transitions are brilliant. We talk about this in soccer when you turn over the ball and how quick you get it back to front. Derry, have, as I say, Derry have always had a brilliant defence. And then they were knocking the ball into maybe Skinner and, and Paddy Bradley and were maybe relying on them or Animal doing that again. The guys are getting forward and maybe when they, the, the inside forwards are getting bottled up, they're going to lay the ball off to Cassie coming through or Glass coming through or these guys. So that's what really impressed me about them is, you know, maybe you have four sets to a team now. You have your goalkeeper who's a standalone position. You have your back six in your midfield and then you have your front set. But the fourth thing is the transition and who's getting up they add to the scoreboard. And that's part of the reason, man, why I think them stats you're producing are brilliant about Shane McGuigan. That's just my one fear. You know, if I'm limiting Shane McGuigan to maybe a point or two from play, uh, 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 Shane McGuigan, sorry, um, from a point or two from play, and I'm maybe limiting the freeze. Bar really now, Toner and Cassidy, who else is contributing more than that to the scoreboard, you know? Um, so, Look, it'll be something to see, but just please watch how fit Derry are and how well they know their roles um, inside out in terms of where they're playing. And these roles are fluid. As I say, Cassie's playing in the middle of the park. He's played corner forward. He's he certainly played in the Ulster final. I think last year he started at, at 12 or 10. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot there. There's a lot to be um, to working on Derry at the minute. And, you know, I think they will be up for the game this weekend. I think that they'll want to go down and put out a marker. Um, and it'll be also interesting to see the way that their kickouts go this weekend against Dublin. But we'll maybe come on to that. Hmm. Yeah, it's very well, uh, big welcome to Matthew Hurley from GA Statsman. How are you? All good, John. Yeah, um, yeah, all, all good. Um, great to you know be on the show again um, after you being on my show last night uh, as well. And yeah, looking forward to this weekend's games. Uh, Cork seems to be going well now. After that, uh, me to park at the first game. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the weekend's games. As the lads mentioned there, Derry Dublin seems like a very good match uh, to get started on Saturday. And of course, you have me and Ross Common on Sunday as well. So yeah, looking forward to it. Great. 
Good stuff, I believe you and Kevy were having a coffee the other day. I wouldn't say it was a coffee, but yeah, we met up for uh, <laughs> we met up for a conversation. Let's just say there was uh, one academic in the room about you, and it wasn't me. <laughs> was it a liquid lunch, lads? <laughs> it was a liquid. It was a liquid dinner. Uh, yeah. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. Good to hear, lads. Good to hear. And we will go on to the other action in Park Talton. It was loud. One fifteen. Mead. One twelve. Mister Hurley. Loud, great win. Mickey Hart would be delighted with that one from last weekend. He will be, yeah. Very, very good win for uh, Lowell. Unexpected as well. And it was great that Lowell GA actually showed the highlights on Twitter. It wasn't shown at all at TG Carroll or RT. And yeah, usual suspects at all, as always there. But uh, yeah, brilliant result for Lowell. And um, yeah, what they've added this year is a brilliant attack. More so than a brilliant defence. They've added Darren McConnell into the forward line. He's hit the lights out along with Samuel Roy. So no, it seems to be motoring along well, and uh, me and Aaron were actually discussing on uh, Sunday evening that Lowe could actually be the second best team in Leinster. There could be an argument there, like we were discussing me being up there after a good start to the league campaign, but why can't Lowe after winning against me? So, very good win for Lowe, very impressive, and it'd be interesting to see how they get on this weekend, and who would have, who would have actually thought Lowe would be fourth in the league after four games in Division, tr- Division 2, so... It's an incredible job Mickey Hart has done and it definitely cements him as one of the best coaches in GA history, in my opinion. Hopefully they don't have a, a Tyrone referee to stop them on this uh, good run that they're on, you know. Let's <laughs> just say that. Brilliant stuff. There's a backstory to that, Kevin. Do you want to explain it? <laughs> yes, I think myself and Mal, I'll tell you, Mr. Martin Sludden, a very distinguished referee, or so to him he was anyway. Um, he was the he's a rectory in charge of when the ball was thrown over the line by Mr. Sheridan. And it wasn't it Joe Sheridan that threw it over the line in twenty ten. Some try, Kevy. It was a good try, yeah. <laughs> brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. I had, beef, I had beef in the accumulator that day and it was the last game I was waiting on, but I took the money, but it was so wrong. Life deserved <laughs> the one answer. Imagine there had been. Imagine the GA had had VAR or Hawkeye then, huh? <laughs> How do you explain no. that one? How do you explain that one? And we will move on to. Oh, this was an interesting one, lads. In Division Two, Croke Park, Dublin, sixteen points clear, one twelve. Kevy, what is going on with the Dubs at the minute? Uh, look, I wouldn't get too. Um, Bottle up and Dublin do what they have to do to win. Um, it's early on in the year. I don't know if they're training hard. Look, I like some of the stuff that's happening with Dublin. I was chatting to Matthew the other night about this. Colin Baskell's in back in a really, really talented footballer. If he gets a run within the team up there with Costello and people like um and Conor Callahan again, they seem to be relying heavily on Dean Rock up front at the minute. I think he kicked six frees in this game. He got eight points overall out of 16, half the score. So, again, that's something that we need to look at. Clare were really, really good. Um, I think they only got two points out of the 112. They got two points from frees, um, three points from frees. So, um, look, Clare were maybe kicking themselves that it came so late on in the game, but um, that's two weeks in a row now that they've dropped points. And as I said to you when I was on at the start of the year, there's that Clare have been winning these types of games in Division 2 over the last three or four years by a point or two. Now they seem to be losing them. They're in a bit of trouble. Um, but from a Dublin point of view, look, I'm, I'm not going to say too much. Look, Lee Gannon's got another year under him. You know, Rock's there, Costo. They have good strength and depth. They'll do what they need to do um, to get out of Division 2. They'll go to Derry this week. Um, I think they'll up their levels that they've been at for the last maybe three, four games. Um, but look, they'll just cruise along. They're doing what they have to do at the minute. I would suspect, in my own opinion, I don't know what the two lads think about this, I would suspect they're probably training really hard at the minute in-house. Really hard. Um, after what happened to them last year. Um, they just look a team that's a wee bit lethargic at the minute. Just going through the motions. There's an air of inevitability about what they're going to do um, in terms of win games. This weekend, there'll be a the sort of acid test. Uh, again, they weren't overly great down in court in the first half. You know, and then obviously Jack McCaffrey. They've just class overall. They've good strength and depth in class. 
and they'll do what they have to do. So I'm not overly worried about them. Um, they'll be in the last four. There's no doubts about it. Screw it down, Kevy. They'll be there or thereabouts, as the man says. And then we'll move on to Saddle's action in Division One in Hastings, McKill Park. It was Mayo 4 10, Tyrone 12 points. And man, I suppose this game was very uneasy if, if you were a Tyrone fan to be watching on at times. They were just very, I suppose, soulless, lifeless, leaderless, probably to a degree. And Mayo just cut them apart. Four goals in the league game once again. And Tyrone. It's hard to know where to go after this game or after that game, uh, Mal, but a great win for the green and red of Mayo. Yeah, certainly. I think probably to balance it out, you have to be fair to throw and say that Mayo is the form team in the country at the minute in terms of results. But um, I still can't get out of my head the body language of the Tron players coming down the tunnel after they drew with Derry in the Mechanic Cup group game. I just remember thinking they were absolutely devastated for a group game that they had control of and missed two chances later on and then have been sort of playing catch up. We said before we come on air here that the concern for them is they, they've lost players from the panel that's been repeated so there's no point in dwelling too much on that but it's the fact that it's inside forwards. I remember Derry played them in the 2019 championship and wrestled with them, played very well, got back into the game Darren McCurry come off the bench, go, game over. They, they, they're losing too many forwards. But to concede four goals against Mayo, you know, if you use Enda Hessian's goal as an example, you can't say it was poor defending because you have to give Enda Hessian cre- credit for the way he finished it. You know, you have to, I think too much is always put at the door of poor defending. Sometimes you have to give the credit to the team that's attacking. But the fourth goal was wide open. That's the thing that will worry them. And I don't know what you boys think, I said it before we come on air, that when you won the All-Ireland with Tyrone, you never seemed to back it up. And Derry hammered them in the championship. Armagh beat them equally comfortably. And I remember thinking, these boys will be absolutely ravenous for revenge. And You know, hurt is an awful thing in sport and it always drives people on. Athletes love to have a chip on their shoulder. They love to read reports where they're tipped to be beaten. They love to be challenged. And I thought they were going to come back all all guns blazing. If they had a good goal against Roscommon, they would have won the game. Would it have been any different? I don't know. But Saturday evening was such a... It was such a... I don't know if you call it a wake-up call because they've had so many of them, but it's... It's a tough, tough day for Tyrone, and it leaves that visit of Kerry this weekend huge. You know, they're going to need a reaction. The last time they conceded three goals, they went out the next week and, you know, they beat Donegal convincingly enough. So maybe maybe you see the chip on the shoulder come out this weekend, but it's hard to make a case for them to stay up. They've Monaghan and Clonus, as far as I know, it's in Clonus. Yeah. And they've obviously Armagh in the last game. Armagh may be focused on the championship because I think it's two weeks before the Antrim game at that point. But it's a, it's a very difficult situation for Tyrone. But they always seem to come out of these scrapes in the past. But you think to yourself, they're probably the team that would be the favourites to go down for me. And as much as it was a really disappointing performance, it's hard not to be impressed by, by Mayo and we still may be hitting Westport for the Monday Club after the All-Ireland, if we're not in there. If we're not in there, that is. <laughs> Brilliant stuff, Kevy. I know you want to jump in there like a man on a mission. Well, I'm going to give Matthew Hurley a stat and hopefully he proves me wrong. Frank Burns may be the first man in GA history to end up uh, with a score difference of minus one playing a match, given his OG. He scored two points and then scored an OG, so he's got a score difference of minus one. Um, <laughs> but no, I think Mal summed it up pretty well. The one thing about Tyrone is they're really proud people, and they will, I would foresee a real kick out of Tyrone this Saturday night, or sorry, this, this weekend. You think so, Kev? Okay. What? You think so? Like, do you think it's a short 
period of time after that Mayo game? Like, do you think they have enough time to work on stuff? Yeah, Kerry are coming into town, and Kerry never get it easy up there. And look, Ome is not never an easy place to go for any team, but they will be licking their lips, you know, okay. no matter if they're on a good run of form or not. Um, we know how good this Kerry team is and the panel is, but if there's any game that Tyrone probably wanted this weekend, in my opinion, it's this game. Um, and if a Tyrone player on this panel is not focused and this management hasn't got these players focused this week after what they've been through over the last... Look, what they've been through this so far in this league, you know, Mal tips them to go down. Oshie McConville said this week he reckons they'll stay up. I just don't like where they are as a team overall. From We said off air from two years ago, very much the same personnel. Very few newcomers. You know, you, I think young Nal Devin Cole Island's in there, maybe one or two other newcomers coming in off the bench. It's basically the guts and the skeleton of the same team that won the All Ireland, bar one or two players. So you have to ask what's going on, what's going on, and what's the issue with the mentality. Yeah. Um, and like so to, on Tyrone, like like as I said to you off air, you know, I think it's James Carr gets uh, the first goal, Aiden O'Shea's goal is, is, is quite lucky, but the James Carr goal, like never in a million years would you see a Tyrone team of the past can see the goal like that, a direct 50 yard kick in over the top, catch back of the net, just never be allowed to happen. You know, God rest him, I think he's dead 19 years today, but when they had the likes of Cormac McAnallen in there at full back, just man ball all. And, you know, it's it was just so on Tyrone, like, um, and has been through the league, you know, I think it's six or seven goals have already conceded in four games. Mm-hmm. And that's what their strength was building and stuff coming out of def- or a strong defence going forward. So, look, I am worried for them. Um, I'm worried for, for Brian Dewar and Fergal Logan because, as I said to you, if they don't get a result on Saturday night, they've a couple of Ulster derbies and there'd be nothing more than the people of Monaghan or the people of Armagh would want than to put their own down. So, and that, as we seen last year, their league performance had a drastic impact on their championship performance as well. Um, so, look, there's a lot to be said about Tyrone this weekend, but I am expecting a reaction. If I don't get a reaction, if, if I don't see a reaction this weekend, I think their season may be done. And that's five games in. I think their season may be done. Yeah. Yeah. Tend to agree with that because they have been nothing short than very poor again, once again. But it'll be a game like that this weekend that could really blow off the cobwebs. And Austin Stack Park, you had Kerry 12 points, Arma 11 points, I suppose. Mal, not a game for the ages, probably what we didn't expect. Mr. Clifford, unfortunately, just didn't live up to the bill. And of course, there's so many more games he can shoot the lights in out in, but probably not a game for the ages that we expected. But uh, Kerry would be happy with the one point win. Yeah, they would. I saw a wee bit of this on. I was saying I saw the probably second half of it, probably as much as I saw. But um, I'm sort of disappointed how low scoring it was. There's no point in saying any different. Um, yeah. The only the only rationale I can see behind it is that Armagh were trying to test some sort of system that would limit Clifford in case they ended up meeting him in all Ireland series. And if if that is the case, then fair enough. You can understand why they would do that. Um, that's that's what I'm putting it down to you. But I was looking forward to seeing them going all out because I enjoyed watching them last year. And uh, Clifford's just such a I don't know what what hasn't been said about him. He's just a real a real star. So that fear factor is maybe there. And Armagh aren't Armagh will still be looking over the shoulder in this league. You know, there's for. A, for, they're, they're one of the teams I thought will they end up in a league final? You know, would a league title be good for our man? Now you, you just need to make sure that they uh, they stay up. But I, I think they will. Uh, the game itself. Um, Do you think our think? fans and the public need to be a bit more realistic about where that team's at, uh, Mal? They probably do. Like, uh, you know, the like the amount of fans they take to places. They like uh, there seems to be a real. Um, I don't know, I suppose it's a bit, a bit like me, oh, that sort of frenzy behind it. I joked to Niall McCoy on Twitter, I says, that's what you get for bringing out the book at Christmas, talking about the good days. You know, when <laughs> people have been, been sucked into it because, you know, let's face it, they were really good days. And 
I probably would love to see them just throw Ray O'Neill in up front and just play, play off him. Maybe that's because Krugan wasn't on, that there was no link, but I, I, from an RMI point of view, I just hope they were trying something for for Kerry later down the track because I think they've far too much to give to, to play that type of football for me. But um, only people inside the camp will know the true sort of reasoning for the way they played. Yeah. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And we'll move on to Sunday's action in Division 1. In Clonus, it was Monaghan, 14 points. Russ Common, 11 points. Another good win for Monaghan down in Clonus. Matthew obviously badly needed for the form of late. And Davy Burke went home with his tail between his legs. Exactly, yeah. It was a, it was a brilliant win for Monaghan. And uh, two wins in a row now. And a few weeks ago, many people, including myself, would have said they're gone simply after two games. And maybe at the start of the league campaign, we were thinking about Vinnie Corey. Is he up to the job? But two wins in a row now. He's building a nice team in Monaghan. And that's without Conor McManus in the starting, in the starting 15. And that just shows you how Monaghan have progressed as a, as a team. McCarroll has come in last two games. He scored 11 points in two games. He's been absolutely outstanding. You know, Carl Gallagher, Bial Bannigan is still uh, chipping away. Steve Lohanlon has been on form in the league for Monaghan. And he didn't score the last day. And that just shows you the amount of variety in the Monaghan team as well. Conor McCarthy there as well, Gary Mohan in uh, midfield, like Roy Began seems to be doing well at the moment for Monaghan. So yeah, it's it's a very very good result for Monaghan. And then um, as the lads mentioned earlier, they've thrown in the next few games. And look at them in Clonus at the moment. You have to back Monaghan to even win that game, and that put them up to six points. You would have to say Monaghan are safe then. So I I think that's a um, mission accomplished really for uh, Vinny Corey. When you look at Ross Common, look, I don't think they'll panic over this. I know it was a bubble burst in some ways from David Burke, but look, six points of a possible eight. Like, that's still impressive enough. And when you look at their kind of draw, um, they're on the same side as Godway and Mayo. I think they'll definitely focus on that. They don't necessarily need a league final to prove themselves. So, yeah, Ross Common, I don't think they'll panic just yet, but very, very good win for Manhattan and very encouraging. And when you look at the Ulster Championship, actually, their first game is against Tyrone. And at this moment in time, I'd actually bat Monaghan to win that game. Okay. They, they probably face Derry in the semi-finals. That's for another day. But but Vinnie Corey seems to be getting the right tune out of these players. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It seems to be definitely getting that kick that he finally needs and wants. And I suppose we move on to action that took place in Lever can, can I just make a point that Matthew, a, a real... Good point that Matthew's made, maybe expand on it, and Mal might want to come in this in, in terms of us being also centric in this. I certainly backed Monaghan to go down and play against Vinnie Curry. He was a real battler of a player. And look, we've got to acknowledge the job he's done. But what really impressed me over the last two games is the way he's using the older statesmen in this squad. So at the weekend, you had Carl O'Connell, uh, McManus, and Fenton Kelly seasoned campaigners coming on. So there's a lot of new bucks that Monaghan have brought in. You know, you've mentioned O'Hallion, you've mentioned Brannigan, who are, who are stepping up to the mark now. And I, look, it was maybe me speaking ignorantly at the start of the year, but that's a real plus for them, you know, where they can bring guys on towards the end of the game. And look, they have, um, they have the next day out, they've, they've got away away. Okay, that's going to be difficult. And then I think they've got two home games against Ulster teams. So I really... At the minute, I don't know, Matthew, about your point that six points will keep you up. I really don't. Um, and that's how mad Division 1 has got. Because, I mean, if if, if Donegal beat Russ Common the next day out, Donegal on five points and all of a sudden drag Russ Common in. Remember, it's, it's you know, we're talking about Tyrone maybe staying on two points if Kerry beat them this weekend. You know, so somebody else has to go down. He could be going down with five or six points. Who knows? Yeah, you're chatting about Monaghan there. Like, um... I think Kerry are the only team in Ireland that have been in Division One longer. You know that they've they've had ten years of football in Division One. Monaghan have been in it nine out of ten years, and Monaghan's resurgence. I'll throw two words at you: Darren Hughes. What a man! You know he played very little football, to my knowledge, all year, and just you're only going by highlights. But watching from highlights, he was immense in the two games. And yeah. you're talking about leadership, Kev, and using players at the right time. How big a coincidence is it that he's back? And I feared for Monaghan at the start of the year. And uh, there's, there's a very good chance they'll stay up. Yeah. Um, it's a case of who, you know, 
I'll be surprised if Toronto don't get relegated, but you know, at the same time, anything can happen in football. I think they're the team that's in the worst position at the minute. But there's three games to play. As, as Matthew said, look at Monaghan, two two wins in a row, and everything changes. So maybe we'll be having a different conversation, and, and Toronto will, will come out of it. But I think Monaghan at this stage is going to stay up. Yeah, yeah, definitely didn't seem like that after the Kerry game, but fortune favours the brave, and that morning have definitely got that look. And we move on to le- um, action that took place in Letterkenny. It was Donegal one nine, Galway one nine. Kevy, I suppose another game that really probably let this side down. Um, I know obviously conditions maybe held to that to a degree, and obviously Paul Connor did have a chance to win at the end, didn't just go over. But another poor game in Division One, Kevy. I love my saying this, right? But Ma was at the game, so for the best interest of the podcast, somebody who was actually on the ground, he was at the game, so maybe give him first say, but I just want to leave him before he says anything. Isn't this kid Matthew Tierney just a joy to watch? Class act, yeah. Brilliant yeah. player. Absolutely brilliant player. It was really yeah. one game there, Kenny. It did, have an, it did have an impact in the game. And uh, I actually threw Donegal into my accumulator this week. I thought that it turned all the way over, to be honest. I had a feeling about it. Maybe it's because I was staying in Larry Kenny and I was sort of got you you know was caught up in the emotion of it all. But you met uh, Joyce in all mal. Met Joyce and the or last Joyce met, or Joyce met you or Joyce met you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, but uh, they did they did they did play pretty well, don't they? Go. I think they did everything but one. They missed yeah. the chances, but when they got the penalty to go five points up, I think it was one five to three at that point. They conceded a goal straight away. And uh, but they didn't score for I think it was something like thirty minutes of the second half, and it was always going to be tough at that stage. But to be fair to them, and Paddy Carr said this in his interview after the game, they needed a reaction after Clonus, and they battled and they battled and they missed chances and missed chances, and eventually they got something, mm. and probably deserved to win it for me, just being at it, but. Uh, you know, it probably wasn't a great game in terms of the amount of times there was no score, but it was one day, and for me, a game when there's 10 months to go and you're not sure who's going to win it, I, I always have a wee, you know, I, I can never take my eyes off it, and plus, your sporting Ulster team, you're all, you know, you're all, you've always got an interest, so, um, probably go and make them better the woods yet, it may be a valuable point you might find as the season goes on. Yeah, I think that, that that point you mentioned about Donegal in the second half, they never scored until the 67th minute from Ocean Gallon. 67th go. minute mm-hmm. until Ocean Gallon. Now, obviously, there's, as you say, man, win factors. But the other great thing for me about Donegal, and I was actually just looking at this on the stats today. So, Matthew, this is maybe one for you, but Donegal never, never win in the league in Letterkenny. And yet every year they bring a game to Letterkenny. They find it very difficult to win in their own back garden there. Um, now, obviously, it's a huge county, and they want to bring it back, games to Ballyshannon and stuff. But um, it's a great point for Donegal. Um, again, I expected Donegal to struggle this year. They got off to a great start, but then obviously two games really poor. Um, that second quarter that you talk about in the first half, Mal, where they're in the ascendancy, but then the big sucker punch comes. And in a way, when you look back in the highlights and the, in the maybe 20 minutes of highlights that I watched, it's possibly a fair result because both teams miss chances, mm-hmm. um, multiple chances, and it's possibly a fair result. Again, uh, just as an aside, good to see Peter Cook getting the start. Really good player from Moy Cullen, somebody that maybe can come into that Galway team. Maybe Finn will give us an insight in the next couple of couple of months to him, but somebody can come into the team that wasn't there last year for Galway. Um, Rob Finnerty again, knocking not two again. That's somebody else who who's a real big plus. Galway are on four points now, I think. Three point four points. And I think they'll be safe enough. Somebody's gonna to have to get relegated though. <laughs> true. True. Who is going to get relegated, lads? Put the gun to the head. Well, if we knew that we would make a fortune. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna go for Tyrone and Ross Common. There's a big one for you. Ooh. Ah, but just stop, Ross Common. I'm telling you, somebody's gonna get relegated on five or six points in in that division. 
It's madness to think, but somebody is going to get relegated in five or six points when you weigh up the games left. Hmm. Uh, it's true. It's, uh, I don't know. I think it's thrown in one other. Yeah. And I, maybe it's because I was at the game. I sort of, I got the feeling Watson Donegal last week that they're not prepared to, that there's still something in them. Um, They'll just need obviously, lads. It obviously hinges on this weekend. Our man, none of all play each other. Like, you know, yeah. so. Mm-hmm. But our man have still Tyrone to play, and they're still Monaghan to play, and then obviously Donegal have still Mayo to play, isn't that right? Yeah, and Ross Common away in the la- a last game. Yeah, so I mean, there's one of the things is if Mayo have enough points in the league final, what sort of team are they going to put out? All these different conundrums, but I really see a couple of teams of maybe five points in Division 1, possibly six, being involved in that. That's how mad that division is at the minute. Yeah. I do think Kerry and Mayo will eventually over the next three games just put away from everybody. Hmm. Yeah. Keep your money in your pocket, lads. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to wait and see. And we move on to this weekend's action, lads, in Division 4. You have London against Carlow in Ricelip at 1pm on Sunday. You have Wicklow against Leitrim in Ockram at half one. And then Sligo v Wexford in Marcus Park at 2pm. And then the other action in Division 4 on Saturday, you have Leash against Waterford in Leash Higher and More Park at 6pm. And then Division 3 action all taking place on Sunday. You have Fermanagh against Tipperary in Edendry at 1pm. Calvin against Down in Kingsman Breathkin Park at 2pm. And Beep on the game will be live on BBC Live Player. And then Westmead against Antrim in TG, Cusick Park at 2pm. And then Longford against Offaly in Glennon Brothers Pierce Park at 2pm. And I suppose we can touch on Division 2 action. Obviously, Mal, the big one this weekend. In Division 2, round 5, it's Derry against Dublin in Celtic Park at 5pm and the game will be live on RT2 and the RT player, Mal McMullen, you're like a kid of Christmas, no doubt. What's that, sorry? You're like a kid of Christmas, no doubt, for this weekend. Uh, definitely, you have to be. Um, you're playing a team of the calibre of Dublin. Uh, um, when you think about the day that we get relegated by Sligo and uh, go down to Division 4, it's just a million miles away and thank God we're back again, and I know we're far from being the finished article in terms of being all Ireland contenders because we need to be able to do something different than we did against Galway last year. But when you've when you've experienced four or five years that like we've experienced of no settled team and you know just constant disappointments, it's just great, and uh, I think it's going to be a sellout. I think. Celtic Park and only 18,000, but I think health and safety, I don't know how this has happened, has brought it down to 12,000 for capacity. Don't, don't ask me how, but apparently it's going to be a sellout and uh, it's just a brilliant opportunity for this group of players to go and challenge themselves. And it's probably, this is probably a, a quite a strange thing to say, that Dublin have probably more to prove than Derry, and that's an awful thing to say because of like, you know, and that's not me disrespecting Dublin. It's, it's probably a compliment, the fact that they haven't, they've got four wins. And I suppose with the, the calibre of player they have, they have probably more to, you know, to probably, maybe the pressure's on them a wee bit more, I don't know. But um, I, I'm, I'm in the same as Kev. I wouldn't panic if you're Dublin. Because I think they have to be tuning heavily because there's no six-week, like, as... Paddy Andrews always says in the football pod, that six-week break that you used to have to get ready for the championship, that doesn't exist. So they have to be tuning heavily, and they've still got, they've still got eight points. So, But maybe they do feel they've something to prove, but this is this is brilliant for Derry. This is an absolutely golden opportunity for Derry, and I think, I said it earlier on in the pod, I think they need to treat it like a championship match. Yeah. When's the next time Derry are going to play a team like this at home when they're on the crest of a wave? Throw the kitchen sink at it, and if you wake up on Sunday and you've come up short, wow, let's go again. But don't don't wait, don't don't, don't live regrets. Go for it, and, and I just can't yeah. wait. The favourite uh, tagline going into this game, uh, Mal, uh, it definitely feels like it's warranted. 
What's that? Sorry, your, your favourites going into this game. It, it definitely feels I, like it's more. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not shocked by that because Derry's form has been very, very impressive. Yeah. Um, and maybe some people are buying into the fact that Dublin, like Dublin, aren't they aren't they're not shit the lights out. We never been knows that, but they're 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 still the Dubs and. I'm sure there's been a conversation in the Dublin setup. I don't know what the rest of you boys think. That we're in Division Two. We've got the Ulster champions in round five. Make sure with eight points before we go to Celtic Park. <laughs> you know, they're maybe the same thinking. Maybe they're the same way of thinking. And let's take Derry down a notch. Let's yeah. go to Celtic Park and show them here we're dubs. Mm-hmm. So maybe this is their game. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll be revved this weekend. And that if if that is the case. Wow, it's going to be some game. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we'll wait and see how it goes this weekend. Really looking forward to that game. Hopefully, it can spark a bit of life into the football action because we definitely need it. And we'll move on to some of the action, lads. It's Clare against Cork in Cusa Park, NS 2 p.m. Mr. Hurley, looking forward to this one. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, just uh, looking forward to catch up with it on uh, Twitter or radio or whatever. It's a, it's a shame it's not shown on live TV, which, which is a. Um, which is a huge disappointment, but anyway, um, yeah, I was in. It or clear. Even highlights I might not even see highlights. Yeah, I mean, might not know. Like you know what RT is like, so you know. But, <laughs> but sure. yeah, but um, but yeah, in fairness, like Clare have done very well in the last two games, and could feel aggrieved. Unfortunately, they lost the species that killed their game. When you look at it back, the in my man double hop uh, foul which was just ridiculous. Uh, I don't know why the referee gave that free to Kildare, but anyway, Kildare won that game. And, and that could be crucial now in terms of relegation because head-to-head records comes into play and uh, Kildare will get ahead of Clare if they're on level binds, which would be most likely um, the whole end up if Clare lose this game on Sunday. So this game is huge for Clare. And I think the fans will get behind Meninas. Um I think Cork are performing very well. You have to be very happy with them in the first few games. And a bit of a stat now, out of the top three defences and the top three attacks of Division 2, they're all the same teams there, Derry, Dublin and Cork. So Cork can say they're up there with um, you know, Dublin and Derry in terms of that. I just feel, though, Clare always raise their game when it comes to a Munster derby. And I just feel, I have that feeling that Clare are going to do it. I just think it's going to be more more of a crucial game for them rather than it is us. And I just think that Clare will be bang up for this. Like when you look at Clare's next few games after the Cork game, they have Derry in match day six. And to be honest, they're not beating Derry no one big. Then they have Limerick, but by then it could be too late. So like this is a huge, huge game. They'll definitely put all their eggs into the basket for this. And yeah, I think I, while Cork are performing very well, I think this is an opportunity for Clare to pull off a major scalp. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll see how that go. Game goes at this weekend. And we'll move on to Loud against Clare in RD. 2 p.m. Kevy can Loud beat a very disheartened Kildare this weekend at home? Absolutely, they can. Um, again, we would expect a reaction from Kildare after how poor they were um, last weekend. But look, They've got two points and they were gained on the road against Clare. Um, they're on the road again. Light have been very impressive in RD. It's a hard place to go. Play there myself. It's not exactly the Bernabeu on a, on a Sunday afternoon, if you know what I mean. Um, but as as Matthew rightly articulated, Mickey Hart and what he's done there and, and Gavin Devlin, very hard to team to beat. And for me, they're going into this game and they know the two points will keep them safe. They know, and that's a huge achievement. We, we all, I think every every man is dog, and, you know, the dog's legs had, had bet this year that uh, Limerick and uh, and uh, uh, Limerick and Louth would go back down. Um, but this is huge for them. Um, what I would say about, about, about Kildare is that, you know, we, we do expect a reaction from them. There is that argument, are, they, are Louth the second best team? I think there's very little between themselves and in second best team in Leinster. There's very little between maybe three or four teams in Leinster right now. Obviously, Dublin are the, the one team out in front. Kildare, Meath, Louth, possibly you could fire awfully in there as well. 
on every given weekend, there's there's not going to be three, four points between them. So I would expect a close game, but given where it is in RD and given the trajectory and the system, and the system that that Louther are on, then I would expect Louth to win. And one of the things, the, the last point I'll make to you is Mickey Hart and, and Gavin Devlin on this project, I think they're into year three. Year three, yeah. People have to look at it takes time for a manager to develop a system. Last year, obviously, Sam Roy was the standout player. You'd also Kieran Byrne. But you did, the overall buy into the squad. Now you've got new guys coming in the squad, adding to the scoreboard as well. It's taken them three years to develop a system, but they're a bloody hard team to play against. And they're turning over the scoreboard. And the other thing I like about them is, mentally, the last day out they played in, in RD, I think it was against, was it Clare against Limerick? Um, which was a nip and tuck game up the last 15 minutes. I think it was Limerick, and they came out uh, and they won. They got on top and won that game. So they're mentally strong as well. So for that reason, I would tip, um, even though I expect a reaction from Kildare, I would tip Live to win and for Live to stay up in that game or in that league. Sorry. Perfect stuff. Can I jump in there on that one? Um, Shoot, man. Kildare, this is Kildare's worst nightmare. Okay. Because Derry went there, and I remember saying to somebody, what do you think? And I said, if Derry gets out of RD with two points, I'll be happy. And only for a goal came in there that led to Niall Toner's goal, Derry, I'm not saying Derry wouldn't have won, but they were absolutely struggling to break life down. And to be fair to Horse and Mickey Hart, they, 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 they know what they have. And as I say, as you said, Kev, it is, a, it, is a, it is a tight pitch, but they played really, really well. And Sam Mulroy was excellent. It's the only time I saw him play in the flesh that wasn't on telly, and he was brilliant. And when Derry left, I remember saying to Connor Glass, he was walking off the pitch as I was going past, and he says, you know, we got two points. You know, you can just see the relief in the Derry players that day. Mm-hmm. And uh, if life had to come out of that one, they could end up they, they could end up in the promotion race. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you're looking for somewhere to go after a humiliation like Newbridge that like Kildare got Newbridge, this isn't what they're looking for. Yeah. Definitely not. Mm-hmm. John, I remember playing a game for uh Antrim in, in, in Louth in Division Four back in the good old days. <laughs> this where I think I'd seen the GP the next day to get as much depression tablets as he would prescribe me. It's like West Bay route, you know. It's a it's a really difficult place to go and and get anything out of. And uh, I suppose they built a fortress there. Yeah. And as I say, this county. Uh, I think I said this to Matthew the other the other night when I had a pint with him. If you take the population of Louth. And the population of somewhere like Antrim, right? And you're comparing apples and pears, and obviously there's a, a large population in Antrim that doesn't play GA through through their um, one way or another. Mickey Hart is a very small group, but he, him and Gavin Devlin, what they've done is they've got buy-in, they've got the county board buy-in, they've got um, a, a set of players that are believe in what they're doing, who are training really, really well, who are very, very fit, who have got their um, a couple of years of success behind them. They're now into that third year of a project. And this is the prototype for any county in Division 4 and Division 3, is seeing what these guys have done. It is a brilliant, brilliant news story. And 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 are they possibly the nuclear? That's the issue. You know, Mickey Hart signed on for another three years. I would expect them to stay in two this year. Could they stay there for three, four, five years? Who knows? Hmm. Hmm. Sustainability, sustainability. We will wait and see. We will wait and see how that goes for them. And it's it's very impressive work that Mickey Hard is doing up there. Obviously, a born winner, and he knows how to win. And we'll move on to Limerick against Mead in TUS Gaelic Grounds at two p.m. on Sunday. Heavy, will you be making the trip to the Gaelic Grounds on Sunday? No, um, but I would expect Mead to solidify their division two. Um. Division two for another year. Look, Meath have again very much like Cork, and again I spoke to Matthew about this the other day. Very schizophrenic. Meath started the league like a house on fire, and then their their last couple of of games have have been really poor. Um, 
O'Rourke knows the game inside out. I think he's got buy in there. Um, and just look, Limerick's probably the game that they need right now. Okay, they have to travel down, but me have a, a, a you know a decent um, quality of player at the minute. I think that Limerick just with the the defeat that they had at the hands of Cork has really knocked the stuff out of him. And again, I come back to what Mal has said and back to my previous point about Mickey Hart. When you've got a manager and you get buy in and you get Billy Lee was that way with Limerick team. He had a couple of years of success. Guys motivated, built in. Ray Dempsey's come in, and uh, it's just look. It's a hard league. They've had the you know they've had Derry one week, then Dublin the next week, and then have to get themselves up for it. I was there at the bottom of Division Two. We had them. I know what it's like. You put in a good performance one week, and then the next week, you know, you go up against a team who's even better, and it's it's really difficult. But I can't see Limerick getting anything out of this game whatsoever. Me to get two points, and I think that will keep me safe in Division Two. Uh, touching on meat football, Kevy uh, Liam Hayes was on off the ball last weekend, and he was a really, really good interview. I don't know if it did any any of his catches and some really, really good nuggets in it. And it, I suppose, as I think it was it uh, Joe Malloy was asking him, like the greatest football of all time, and he was just alluded to the fact that maybe Jack O'Shea in the seventies and eighties, if he was playing now, he'd just be unstoppable. I suppose Kevy, your analysis of that, and he was kind of saying, "Cool the Jets on Mister Clifford." Um, I'm gonna say one thing very quickly here, Mal. I, I hope. I wrote an article for the Gaelic Life and was writing for them about this. Liam Hayes out of our skins is easily, easily the best GA book I've ever read. Easily. It is reality of Ireland of what a guy who, obviously you could write, he was a, he's a journalist by trade. He updated it then when he had cancer himself. He tells about the horrifying story of his brother, you know, committing suicide. He is what a village in Ireland was. And his intro to the book, I used to read to any tomb that I ever took. This is my changing room. Some players will never leave, leave this changing room as my friends. Some will be friends the rest of my life. The smell of wintergreen. Liam Hayes is one of the most articulate people ever to write about the GAA. A phenomenal, phenomenal guy. And if anybody's listening to this podcast, out of our skins, what a GAA book. What a book. It's phenomenal. Um, but... In terms of clever, yes, I think he's right. Look, we have to remember, and this is this is hard to say. David Clifford's won all one all Ireland medal in Kerry. He wouldn't even be invited to the the second year reunion if you know what I mean down there. You need six or seven medals, and he is outrageously talented. And there's a lot of media focus now that maybe the likes of Jack O'Shea or Pat Spillane wouldn't have got back in the day. Remember, you, you know, Lim Hayes talks about. Um, um, Jack O'Shea, for me, Pat Spillane is still the greatest Gaelic footballer that ever lived, including Colin, Colin Cooper. Lifted in All-Ireland when he was 18 years of age as captain. Obviously, there were circumstances around that. You know, won every medal that there was in the book, minor under 21. First GA player ever to come back from a cruciate ligament injury. Um, beat many of the world's greatest um, people in world superstars. You know, beat Kevin Keegan, Carl Lewis. He beat all of these guys. So there's a lot, a lot of other stories out there. It's just because there's a lot of media focus on David Clifford. And I, I think that's the point. I'll leave it at this. I don't know what the other guys think. This is the point I was trying to make to you last year. These carry guys have won a lot of underage titles. Hmm. A lot of them, maybe some of them have three or four minors and a couple of under 21s. Doesn't cut the mustard down there. Hmm. You know, it doesn't cut the mustard. Just because social media and, and, and the modern era, I think that these guys need to kick on now. And I would agree with Liam Hayes, you know, just bide your time yet. Bide your time. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it was an ex- excellent interview. So it was mild picking up and Kev, what would be your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I've caught up with Liam recently. He's asked me to write a book. I mean, I've been on the phone to him a couple of times and he just comes across as a really switched on guy. And uh read the book myself. No fluff in it at all. It's just as it is. And... Uh, yeah, he's saying about Jack O'Shea, that like Jack O'Shea was just, he, he could play it any way he wanted. Um, Anthony Dole, for me, was the best footballer I ever saw playing in the flesh, you know, from you know going to games, not TV, I mean, just going to watch it. And Jacko obviously, was the king. Yeah. You know, they had the medals to prove it. Kevin okay, talks about Pat's plan. Um, Clifford's got the potential to be the best ever, but um, Kevin's probably right. The fact you do need to be getting more than one All-Ireland medal 
Pat Spillane introduced himself at a dinner dance one night. Uh, the boy says, you could eat all your own medals. And when he got the microphone, he says, no, I've only got seven. We don't count one in a rose and carry. So mm-hmm. they don't rate that. You know, the, that was Pat Spillane's joke, but he was, get, he was getting it out there. But mm. um, from that point of view, Kev, Clifford's probably going after have to rely on a whole team to come along and one, two or three for him to really be class great. But the reason why I think he's the greatest is he can throw it into him any way you want and he'll run it. And he seems to play football as if it's into the goalposts in the backyard. That's what I love about him. He seems to just play as if it's out in the garden, like, and it's great. And it uh, be interesting to see how much he actually goes on to achieve, but he's got the potential to be the best ever. Okay. Greatest of all time at the minute, or do you agree with what Mr Hayes was kind of alluding to, Mal? I think, well, I think it's hard to... Tells it's hard to say that he's going. To, he's the best player ever when he's only you know he's only been playing senior football for four or five years. But mm. um, I think if he keeps going on this tangent, he'd be, he'd be the best footballer there's ever been. But it depends how you judge it. Like if you look at yeah. Lee Keegan, like me and my brother was away at the weekend and we we're just chatting with Lee Keegan and you know mm. we're just saying like what a player. Mm. Like he, like what a player he hasn't got an all Ireland medal his name, but th- does that mean he's any less of a footballer? Definitely not. Mm. Um, it'd just be a pity that if they do one the Ireland, he won't have it. Yeah, I suppose, Sean, it's all in the eyes of the holder, but I think we're in the, the very infancy. I don't know what Matthew thinks about this, but we're in the infancy stages of of, of seeing David Clifford in terms of, you know, Miles rightly put it, he's, he's only been on the scene three, four years. When we look at somebody like, for instance, when I was growing up, even, uh, even though I, 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 he managed me, and I'm not trying to be biased here, but when I watch people like James McCartan or Greg Blaney, what footballers they were from an Ulster perspective, you know, and then the gener- sorry, a couple of years after that, Canavan was probably the finest forward I've ever seen in Ulster. And that's saying something when you've got McCartan, Blaney, when you've had Brawley for all his hatefulness, um, when you've had somebody like, uh, uh, like Sean O'Neill, who people from my father's generation before me will tell me, was, was one of the greats of the game. So it's all in the eyes of the holder. And, you know, Mal talks about, you know, Clifford putting it in any way to him. There was something really special about watching John Egan and uh, and Mikey Shakey and Ogie Moore. These guys were all different sorts of players. So people will have different opinions. Mm. But at the minute, David Clifford is still in his, maybe his first five years of maybe 15 or 16 year career. Um, so we need to be quite cautious. He's got yeah. all the talent. He's got look. He's a superstar in for in terms of the modern era of social media and, and media. Mm-hmm. But he is not on the same tra- trajectory as somebody like Shiki or Paddy O'Shea or or Pat Spillane in terms of being the most successful player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a conversation worth having, gents. It just sparked my interest at the weekend. I suppose we will move on to a Division One action on Saturday night. It's Armagh against Donegal in Boxit. Athletic grounds at half seven on TG Carr. Mr. Hurley, the thoughts ahead of this one? Big game, big game. Look, you look at um, like whoever loses this game, I'd say is in major, major relegation trouble. And um, it's a huge game for Armagh more than more than Donegal to an extent because a lot of expectations over this Armagh team this season. Um, yeah, look, if they if they manage to lose this Armagh, suddenly you'd be thinking relegation is a huge possibility for them. But when um, Mal actually mentioned Donegal, there was passion in them the other day. I, I just feel their home farm is very, very good. Their way farm is a bit questionable though. So, look, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they, um, you know, approach this game at the Atlantic Grounds at the weekend. Like, it's interesting to know, like, both of these sides, between both of them in four games, have scored two goals. You know, that's very, very low. And it probably epitomises how how much of maybe a boring contest this will be. Maybe it would be tactical on Saturday and maybe both sides don't want to give too much away when you when you look at the relegation battle down the line and even the Ulster Championship, which would be as competitive as ever. So it's going to be a huge game. It's going to be huge for Kieran McGee as well because like when you look at last year, there was Armagh were the crest of a wave. And if they managed to go down this year, Jeez, it'll be like all the hard work could be gone down the drain and, and down to nothing. So 
huge game for Armagh, huge game for Johnny Gold as well to you know back up a decent enough performance last Sunday. Um, it, it's going to be a difficult one to call it. Probably edge it towards Armagh, though. They'd be more more buoyed for survival, especially after the last game against Kerry, where they didn't really attack Kerry as much as people would have liked. That was the most disappointing thing about Armagh in the last game. So I'd say they want to right the wrongs there. And I think Armagh, this is the game where they have to step up. Hmm. Any can other thoughts on that, gents? Kevin Mal? It's just such a, big, it's such a big game in every way. Um, yeah. And probably the pressure is probably on Armagh because they're at home. Yeah. I think the other thing is, as Mal already pointed out, if there is a plan behind what they done last weekend, right, to contain Kerry, I think Donegal have more attacking flair up front than Armagh do. Armagh had seven different scores last weekend. One of them was a goalkeeper. One of them was uh, was Charlie Oga, I think, got two points. They're over-reliant on, on, on Rain O'Neill still, in my opinion, without Rory Grugan in the side. Connor Turbot come off the bench to score. But for me, Armagh may just at home drag Donegal down to that level. So if they have a very defensive system, I think they may be able to combat uh, Donegal's aces up front. And again, we talk about Donegal missing McBearty, you know, the leaders that Donegal need to step up. Obviously, you're looking at Ryan McHugh, Oshin Gallen, Michael Lang, and these sort of guys. But I think Armagh might just drag them down to a level. And if it gets into a dogfight, I think there's only one winner, and that's Armagh. Yeah, we will wait and see on Saturday night. We're really just hoping for a good game at this stage in Division 1. And hopefully that will provide us on Saturday night. And we'll move on to Sunday's action, lads. It's Galway against Monaghan in Pierce Stadium at quarter to one. And TG Carr, the fair coverage, will be showing that live. I think that might be a bit of a mix-up. We'll wait and see. Uh, Mr. McMullen. Um. Yeah, well, it'll be a bigger game for Monaghan. I don't know. It's... it's Galway were relieved last weekend. You can see the body language on them along the sideline when it was over. I know they had your, the chance. Your deep toe was worrying me there. I didn't know what you were going to say. It was yeah, there. no, no. The, <laughs> the, 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 the fact, um, the fact that they were sort of outplayed for much of the second half, but they still could have won it with the last kick. Um, they probably more to, maybe more to lose. They're at home. Maybe I'm one of these people who are putting the pressure on the home team, but. Uh, Mon on away from home. I, don't, I just don't know. Possibly a draw here. Draw maybe would do both teams. But Gobi last weekend. Rob Finley made a bit of a difference when he came on, but the concern will be that well, number one, they they they, they just about got over you know, they just about got the draw. Like Donegal hit three points in a row and Galway were looking like losing it. The worry again would be that the penalty came from a high ball that wasn't dealt with. So last year they didn't seem to they didn't seem to address that situation with the high ball going in that Armagh got so much joy out of that day. And uh, just from chatting to a few Galway people at the game, there doesn't seem to be another backup keeper. There doesn't seem to be another option in there. So that's probably something you know. Do do they use Gary Moon closer to goal, Monaghan? Do they really go for that? Um, I don't know, but go for a draw here. Hmm. We'll wait and see on Sunday, and then moving on to the other games on Sunday. You have Tyrone against Kerry in O'Neill's Healy Park at quarter to one. I suppose, Kevy, going into this game as we're talking earlier on, Tyrone, no better game for them to get pumped up. This could be the very game, but Kerry will need a win as well to keep up the momentum. Obviously, Jack O'Connor was saying after the game that they don't need to win Division One, he was very honest, but. He would love to beat. Uh, he would love to beat Tyrone. Let's not get away from it. No, not let's not get away from it. It's probably uh, the second biggest rivalry in the GA over the last twenty years. Um, Tyrone people will be out in their numbers. They'll be wanting a response from their team. But all arrows point to a Kerry victory. Kerry have been quite lethargic in the league this year. Don't let's not get us wrong. Very poor down in Castle Bar. Lacked energy. Lacked intensity that was seen. Okay, maybe a hangover from last year. Their defence that we talked so much about in that game was horrible. Um, last week, if I could put it, they laboured to victory, just came 
in the last furlong really to beat Armad done enough. Um, so we're also expecting Kerry a wee bit to bounce into the league here a bit. Okay, they were they were playing a Monaghan team that really wasn't going well at that stage, and we expected a home victory for Kerry. But look, Clifford O'Shea are back in now, but I, I think we both we all want to see his GM enthusiasts better performances from them. They were quite um, tempered last week. Um, I think with the bench that they have as well, obviously. Um, don't know Sullivan and Tony Brosnan coming on last week. Tony Brosnan for me is a phenomenally talented footballer. You know, oh, the point Dara Monaghan, class again. Yeah, class. Yeah. Dara Monaghan's come back into into the team group man of the match last weekend. You know, he's another one putting his hand up. We have obviously more of the carry guys to come back in over the next couple of weeks. Um and their energy and work rate against Armad was a lot better. But I expect Kerry's performance to be substantially better this week than it has been in the in the games thus far. On the counter side of that, I do expect a big response from Tyrone. Conventional wisdom on your docket, you're going carry all day long. Uh, um, they have more aces in the pack. If Clifford clicks, the way that the Tyrone defence has been in two out of the four games already, what is it, six or seven goals, Matthew, have conceded in the league already this year. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you just can't give Kerry one goal opportunity and they'll punish you. Um, so for me, I think, even though I expect a response out of Tyrone, I would expect Kerry to win this weekend um, in in um, in in Oma and really kickstart that, as I say, I think over the next couple of weeks, we'll see with the games they have coming up against Roscommon and is it Galway as their last game. I would I would foresee them themselves and Mayo coming out um, as the top two teams in the league. Perfect stuff, perfect stuff. And uh, we will move on to the last game of the weekend in Division 1. It's Ross Common against Mayo in Dr. Hyde Park at quarter to three. And the game will be live on TG Car. Local derby, Mr. Hurley. Looking forward to this one. Definitely so. Yeah, I'd say it's going to be a huge game. Like Ross Common kind of kind of um, disappointed last weekend against uh, Monaghan. They'll be able to get back up the horse. Mayo have been absolutely outstanding. Like as bad as Toronto more last Saturday. Mayo were outstanding. Uh, um, I think it was Kevy mentioned earlier on about uh, in, or um, Mal or one of them mentioned about Ed Hessian. What a goal that was! Uh, brilliant, brilliant dummies to get over them to own players. And ain't no shade. Like I said it on Twitter during the week, redemption arc. What a, what a, a turnaround this season. You look at the two goal involvements in the first half, and a lot of people have been giving them a, 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 quite a bit of stick over the past year or so. And uh, I think we're fairly so about um, him. Like he's been. Absolutely outstanding in this league campaign. And I think Kevin McStay has definitely found a position for him, which is brilliant to see. James Carr, three goals already, and he's hitting the lights out. There was questions about James Carr in the past few seasons. Is he up to this level? Does he have the fitness for this level? He's definitely showing it this season. He's done absolutely outstanding. And you look at the players coming onto the pitch or on the bench, Kevin McLaughlin's there, Killing O'Connor. Like they can't even get in the starting lineup, but they'll, they'll definitely offer something behind the scenes. A bit of tactical knows a bit of experience so that's brilliant to see from a male point of view the midfield is looking good at the moment with Matthew Ryan especially Dermot O'Connor like Tyrone were again bad for the four goal but the powering run from O'Connor can't go unnoticed what a goal that was as well Jordan Flynn has done brilliant with seven points for play in this campaign as well so all looking good for Mayo and I think they will have enough this weekend against Roscommon like Roscommon I don't necessarily don't think they'll go down I think honestly they still have to play Donegal at home, so I still think they'll get at least a point out of that, and I think they should be safe, more or less. But um, yeah, it should be an interesting game, more or less, this weekend. And uh, yeah, Mayo motoring along very nicely, and I think they'll have enough to get over their kind of rivals. Perfect stuff. Any thoughts on that game before we wrap up, lads? Are happy enough? Just on the Mayo thing, uh, I think the role that Aidan O'Shea is playing. Just for, it gives them another option, but it also no team is going to leave Aidan O'Shea marked on the edge of the square or in that area. If he, if if they've used them all through the league, it keeps the other team that wee bit more honest. It might open up the rest of the attack. Um, and I'm sort of loath to jump on the Mayo bandwagon because they've let us all down so many times. But thankfully, thankfully they seem to have. I don't know. Has there, has there been a team has brought through so many new players and over this past four, five, six years than Mayo? 
Uh, and my old club football, I don't know an awful lot about it. I just see the county champions when they're playing a Connacht. So, but they, there just seems to be there's all there's all always enthusiasm in the county, but they must have some influx of football, and they're fanatical. But Aidan O'Shea at full forward could be has the potential maybe to change Mayo this year in, in a big way. I think that's a good point, Miles made about the new influx of players. It usually takes a couple of years, as I say, to bed into them. I think the other thing that we need to recognise here is Kevin McStay knows the game inside out and he's watched Mayo from afar for the last five or six years. And it's quite obvious that he's bringing a different style of play already to them. Um, yes, O'Shea on the edge of the square is fine, but the options that he has now. Now, we always remember Mayo bringing this team that goes into Crow Park and, look, for want of a better word, shits the nest. Right, they they have good forwards, good players, but when the bit comes to the bit, they lose the plot. Now we're looking at okay, it's early on in the season. Miles right the camp of this with let's be reluctant, but when you look at that forward line, when you look at Carr, when you look at the uh, Aidan O'Shea, when you look at um, Ran O'Donoghue, when you look at the possibility of Tommy Conroy, when you look at the two Connors, you know, when you look at Jordan Flynn maybe playing when half forward if if Ruan and uh, and Loft is playing them into the field, right? They have a hell of a lot of options here going forward. I would argue as much as they've ever had before, if not more. You know, Kevin McLaughlin coming off the bench, people like that, experienced players. So it's really um, all credit to Kevin McStay. He's watched them far. He's changed it up a bit. He's brought in one or two new guys who he knows in around there. And, you know, for me, they'll be looking at target in the league final and winning that. Um and then seeing where they can go on. The, the current championship's going to be that wee bit, as I say, three, what we would say, three strong teams on one side of the draw. But when we all doubted Mayo, and we all thought maybe just after the likes of Keegan, Aidan O'Shea was getting over, you know, Rob Henley had been a lot of miles on the clock. Kevin McLaughlin had a lot of miles on the clock. All of a sudden, there's this reinvigoration. Mal rightly says about club football must be really strong. A lot of young contenders coming in there and a lot more to come back in. And they're, that's going to be really, they're the dark horses. They really are now. You know, we knew over the last couple of years they had a great team that seemed to have gone away, but this year, really dark horses. Yeah, we will wait and see if the Mayo bandwagon can get going for the year ahead. It looks good at the minute, lads. To wrap up, um, the player of the week was Mr. Jeremy O'Connor from Mayo, and the team of the week was Rory Began, Jack Kerwin, Owen McAvoy, Enda Hessian, Caelan McCulligan, Caelan McDoherty, Stefan O'Cumber, midfield of Jeremy O'Connor, Matthew Tierney, no surprise there, half forward line of Kieran Downey, Keith Barron, Michal Bannigan from Monaghan, and then the full forward line of Shane Wigan, Aidan O'Shea, and Chris Oak Jones. Kevin McGarty, your player to watch this weekend and Ben of the weekend. Um, I'm going to go for Accumulator in Division 3, if that's all right. And that's um, Fermanagh to win at home against Tipperary. Three home teams, Fermanagh against uh, Fermanagh to win against Tipperary. Cavan to beat Down. Um, Westmeath to beat Antrim. And the only away team I'm going for is Offaly to beat Longford. My alternative bet is Long Longford and Offaly as a draw. <laughs> um, <laughs> My player of the week to watch is quite obvious because he's the Tyrone captain, Tyrone leader in Polly Hampshire. Um, as I said last week, he was hung out the dry. I've never seen him like that before. He's a fitness guru. He's been the leader of this team for the last couple of years. Um, we've really questioned uh, their, their, their body language, as Mal says, and the mentality over the last couple of weeks. This is a huge game for them if they want to stay in Division 1. And I have no doubts that Carey will go up there with the strongest team and Clifford will play and he will probably mark Clifford. So, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what happens there um, with him. He needs to set the tone. He needs to lead this team because the way I see it at the minute is the cart and the horse here have bolted um, and they need a huge performance this weekend. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Mr. McMullen. Uh, bet of the week, uh, Derry and Louth double. Is there value in that? No idea. I'm not, I haven't even, don't even know what the odds are. <laughs> mm, 
Okay. I just I throw on random accumulators and don't even look at the odds. I just look for a bit of interest on a Sunday. So brilliant, brilliant we'll for that. Player of the week that I'm looking out for is Oshin Gal. I saw him last weekend. Obviously Murphy's gone and McBeardy's gone, so Donegal needs somebody to step up. Connor O'Donnell has scored eleven points from play. He's their top scorer. But Oshin Gal last weekend, every time he get the ball. He took his man on all the time and they looked like something was going to come off it. So now in the biggest game of the year, uh, sorry, the biggest game of the weekend, take the dairy bias out of it that I'm looking forward to. The biggest game of the weekend is at the athletic grounds and I'd be interested to see how Oshin Gallon plays. Interesting. Man at the moment, Mr Hurley, what are we thinking? In the week, it's probably going to stir a lot of people up the wrong way now, but I'm going to go Dublin to beat Derry in Celtic Park. Oh, God. Man, oh, oh. blood pressure is rising. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Keep going. And, <laughs> Does that mean, John, you're going for a draw? Oh, interesting. I, I, I think Derry will win it. I think Derry will win. Yeah. Be very confident. Yeah. I think so. And, um, I think and, I I fancy Derry, but I do think that Dublin have more to prove because yeah. of who they are and the yeah. way they're playing. Mm-hmm. And I do believe that they will have looked at this game a wee bit like I did. I think the Dubs will say, right, let's get the points <clears throat> and we'll in the Ulster champions, and let's see where we're at. That. Yeah. Player to watch, Mister Early. I'm going to go probably for the low Kildare game in Division 2. I'm going to go Dar McConnell. Scored 10 points so far for Lowe's. And I think this game against Kildare, Kildare, I think, have the third worst defence in Division 2. So I think this is the game where he starts to fire maybe three, four points for play, I think, for this guy. He's a, a live warrior, even for Ardy St. Mary's in the club championship. Watching him very closely. So I'm going to go Dar McConnell as the player to watch. He's very good against Derry that day as well. John, just a last point, and Malcolm maybe back this up, and it's important to get this in. The GA, when we talk about, we talked earlier about Jarlath Burns and structures. The GA is heading for Derry City this weekend, and it wasn't a bastion of GA uh, activity for a long, long time. It was abandoned by the GA, and this is a huge game for the city. You know, Steel's down to, doing so well, and you know we talk about Derry being back in Crow Park or winning in Clonus last year. You know, when we're looking about developing the games, this is another city we need to attack, and it's great to see that game going to Derry City this weekend. It's not everybody from South Derry's favourite venue, but, you know, it's it's absolutely brilliant to see, in, you know, the third or fourth largest city in the island getting that profile this weekend is, is probably being the game that everybody's going to watch, isn't it? It's just class. Hmm. Dubs are coming to town, man. What do we think? Happy yeah, they are. Um... My concern about the city is that the day before Derry played Donegal and Ulster final, I went shopping to Derry and wore my Derry jersey because when you're in the press box, you can't wear your colours. And there was very, very few Derry jerseys walking about Derry City the day before Derry and Donegal. And I remember going home and I was worried. I thought, is there anybody in Derry City interested in GA? Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, sorry, there's a few pockets of really, really good GA people. But the concern is there's not enough. Um, that was shocking the day before Nostra final. It should have been absolutely dairy jerseys hanging out of every corner. Um, and the people who are working in GA, like you, you said it, Kev Steelstown, they won on all Ireland at, at a canter. And the, the people getting the clubs going up around there are, are GA people. The worry is that how do you attract the people who aren't GA? Um, and for Derry to be a super power, you, t- you chatted about it with, with the dubs, Kev. They need to tap into the city, and my worry is that it's not there. I just hope it does come, and that the people who are really putting the effort in start to multiply and multiply. And mm-hmm. who knows? Maybe there will be people come out of the woodwork this weekend because the dubs are coming to town, and then they'll think, I want to be part of this, because Derry City is flying at the minute. Rory Higgins is an excellent manager, so... There's a bit of competition there between the two sports, but surely, surely there's a place to, to support both teams for me. Mm-hmm. I'm breaking news, John. 
Our president elect, Mr. Burns, is now introducing a club ranking system to tackle referees' abuse. Your club will be ranked, and at the end of the season, they may be downgraded. So, brilliant stuff. Absolutely riveting. <laughs> Yeah, I think that probably sums up where we're going to be getting our uh, leadership from, Kevy. But we will wait and see. <laughs> Former Antrim footballer Kevin McCurdy, Gaelic Life journalist, Spike of a Bullen. Uh, GS, that's one match early. Thanks, Wayne. Night, boys. Bye. Podcast to get 15% off on their website. Cheers, boys. Thank you. And just like that, Kevin's gone. Cheers, boys. Thanks.